For those that are visiting, we've been in an incredible study in the book of Luke. Today we're going to be in chapter 13. And I've simply entitled the lesson today from a statement that Jesus makes inside of this chapter. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. We have three points. Verses 1 through 9 are entitled, Time is Running Out. Verses 10 through 21. In time, the kingdom changes the world. And verses 22 through 35, time to decide. Let's get to the text. Time is running out. We remember, we left off in chapter 12, where Jesus was telling the people, look at the sign of the time. Be reconciled to God. And now we read in chapter 13, verse 1. Now there was some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Right here, Jesus looks at two tragedies. The massacre by Pilate and the falling of the Tower of Siloam. The massacre by Pilate is one that is troubling to the heart. But begin, we begin to see the kind of man this guy Pilate was. In fact, he murdered a group of Galileans that evidently had gone down to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices. And as they were offering the blood of the sacrifice, they were killed and their blood was mixed with the sacrifice that they were giving. A ruthless man, this guy Pilate. In the second one, the Tower of Siloam was called so because the reservoir for the water for the city of Jerusalem was right there by the tower in the Pool of Siloam. The Tower of Siloam was where the east and the south walls came together there. And evidently there was a calamity, a so to speak natural disaster, some would say an act of God, that caused the tower or the scaffolding perhaps to fall and 18 people were killed. In that time, and I believe in our time, when bad things happen, we kind of jump to a conclusion. Well, evidently, this was a horrific thing that happened to get those Galileans. This was a horrific thing that happened to these people in the Tower of Siloam. They must have done something incredibly evil. And there was a chance for Jesus to speak on the politics of his time. But this is not what Jesus did. Jesus simply said, he said, do you think these people were more evil than the other Galileans? Do you think these people in Siloam were more evil than others there in Jerusalem? See, Jesus' point is just because bad things happen to people doesn't mean that God is at all punishing them. As a matter of fact, the book of Job speaks very directly to this. And our own Christian experience says that suffering often comes when we do right. And yet, Jesus does not jump into the political arena. Jesus says, listen, whether it's by unnatural causes or by natural causes, time is running out. And you either need to repent or you will perish for all eternity. Jesus lays it out. You know, this call to repent or perish is an urgent one. I was talking to our brother Chris Adams, who leads the church out in Syracuse this past week. And he says, brother, i got to tell you about this, this one guy that got baptized a couple weeks ago. He was an older guy. I said, well, how old was he? He was 62. I said, bro, he's not that old. 
He says, well, he's an older guy. His name was Jim Rizzotto. And he was an Italian chef. And he says, when he first came to church, I would have to say he was one of the most ornery guys I've ever seen. So, well, what happened? He says, brother, he came into the church and he saw the love of God. He came back and he came back. And he says, I finally found friends. He started studying. And at 62, and for 50 years being addicted to smoking and drink, he made the radical decision to repent and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, you can teach an old dog new tricks. You know, I don't know about you. I mean, when Violet was up here, wow. Wow. I don't know how long I have to live, she said. But as long as I'm alive, I will live for Jesus. You see, Jim understood it was repent or perish. As a matter of fact, his lifestyle was leading him more and more into the darkness. And he understood that when he repented, Jesus would give him the help to change. You know, a lot of people are thinking, man, I just wish I could change. I wish I could change. Hey, you need to get baptized. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you the power to change. There are many disciples that are wandering in the so-called spiritual desert out there. That may include attendance to church. And yet their lives are a disaster. A disaster. Because they have lost the lordship of Jesus Christ. I also appreciate Dave Swan. I mean, Dave lives clear over in Ventura. And very often he drives all the way down to San Diego for Bible talk. Why? To get his mom there. You know, Dave's seen his two oldest children baptized. Now he's got his mom in the kingdom. Why? He's willing to do whatever it takes. He's urgent. He knows that time is running out. Now, Jesus shifts this a little bit from individual to a national view. Look on in right here. Verse 6. Then Jesus told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. But let's just stop right here a second. We understand the fig tree always represents what? Israel, right? And planted in his vineyard. So the vineyard represents, in this case, the whole world. You know, it's amazing how much Jesus talks about world evangelism. And certainly, Luke brings that forth in his gospel, doesn't he? About the evangelization of both Jew and Gentile and the entire world in that generation. He says, this man had a fig tree, Israel, and planted in a vineyard the whole world. And he went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. There was no fruit in the Jewish nation. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. There was accountability. He says, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? So the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Well, now cutting it down is a statement of judgment. Go back quickly to our text in Luke 3 in the ministry of John the Baptist. And we'll find a similar terminology. In verse 9 of chapter 3, the axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That phrase is a statement of eternal judgment. Now right here, at first it looks like, wow, there's a lot of hope in this thing. And, And And there is the grace of God, is there not? For three years, there was nothing. Well, in the Old Testament times, and the New Testament times, a vineyard was expected to produce fruit the third year. If it didn't, it was cut down. Because that was the expectation. Besides, it was taking up space that could be used for another tree that would bear fruit. It was taking up nutrients and attention from another tree that would bear fruit. And yet, the grace of God 
says, give it one more year. But the grace of God only goes so far. He says, if it doesn't bear fruit, and frankly, the way that Jesus tells the parable, it doesn't look too good. Then the patience of God runs out, and judgment comes, and it's cut down. You know, I really appreciate Kyle. What a tremendous young man. I think you can sense the humility that he has before the Lord to become an evangelist. And for this young man to step on up and to realize the judgment of God had come upon the little congregation that asked him to be the minister took a lot of guts. See, the church that he was with at one time had 100 on Sundays. But it dwindled by the time he was asked to be the minister to about 35, 40. At one time, it was a church where everybody was a totally committed disciple. And now there was plagued with lukewarmness. People didn't come to midweek. People weren't in studies at all. It's been, it's been over a year since it had even been a baptism. And Kyle said, hey, we've given this a year. We've, we've had all the grace we can. Now it's time for judgment. It's time for decision. He asked Elena and myself to come on over. And we called the remnant out. Out of those 35, only 12 said, I want to be a sold-out disciple. And yet, in the next year, 20 were baptized into Christ. That's incredible. See, judgment is meant to bear fruit. It's not that God is evil or bad. Even the running out of patience is to produce fruit of the kingdom. You know, it's been incredible. Not only was Kyle and Joan amazingly fruitful over there in Hilo, but when they've come over here, in the nine months that they've been training, 16 people have been baptized in their ministry. Is that incredible? People like Daryl and Shireen and Sam and Lorenzo and Josh and Team and Alyssa and Joe Young and Joe Green, Nave, Leah, and I'm probably missing a few others, but the bottom line is they are bearing fruit. Amen, guys? And we need to get a conviction to get urgent. Time is running out. The issue is not whether or not someone dies a natural death of old age or an unnatural one with an atrocity, a political atrocity, or with an act of God from nature. Those are not the issues with Jesus. The issue with Jesus is, are you right with him when you die? And all of us are a day closer to the day of our death than we were yesterday. Time is running out. Point two. In time, the kingdom changes the world. This next section is a lot of fun. Verse 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Now, we got to stop right here. You know, it's very interesting. This is what they call a mirror miracle. In other words, it's something that parallels and mirrors something that's happened before in the book of Luke. Well, what is it? Well, it's the Sabbath. And you know something? Jesus could have healed this woman on Thursday or Friday. Could have waited till Sunday or Monday. But he goes, you know something? I'm going to do it on the Sabbath. <laughs> See, Jesus is always looking forward to the Sabbath. Are you always looking forward to church? Because that's where the miracles happen right there. And this was, this, uh, we got to paint the situation right here. It says there's a woman who had been crippled by a demon. Demons are real, guys. They were real in that day, and they're real today. They're crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Wow. See, we think if we have bad troubles for three months, six months, three years, this woman was allowed by the sovereignty of God to be in pain 18 years. And the Bible says she was bent over. The Greek actually says bent double. 
So it's like this. And it says that she could not straighten up at all. Let's read on. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her. That's the Lord, amen. And immediately she straightened up and praised God. Now, isn't that just like Luke? He always notes that when a miracle happens, it's done, boom, zap, immediately. And then once it's done, the person that had the miracle goes, praise God. That's what you do when a miracle happens in your life. Let's read on. Let's, let's see how fired up everybody else was. Verse 14. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox and donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all of his opponents were humiliated. But the people were delighted with the wonderful things he was doing. You know... This guy, Jesus, was just flat divisive. Every time he preached, he divided people. You just couldn't remain neutral about Jesus. The synagogue ruler was humiliated. Now, it's kind of interesting, guys. Luke writes this for a very, very special purpose. We need to understand that he is trying to show what's going on in the Jewish leadership. In chapter 6, we have the mirror miracle of the, the healing on the Sabbath. And it says at that time, the leadership was furious with Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. And so now we are, a couple years later, further down the ministry of Jesus, many miracles later, and Luke says, we're going to see if the Jewish leadership has changed any. And the answer is, Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, now what they've begun to do is that this guy was so disrespectful, he didn't even talk to Jesus. Because, see, he knew he couldn't change Jesus' mind. Do people try to talk you out of stuff? A lot of people should be leaving you out, saying, I'm never going to change her mind. I'm never going to change his mind. Didn't even bother talking to Jesus, but you know something? He said, you guys... Why in the heck do you look at this guy, Jesus? There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. As if he was going to do the healing. And the Lord says, you hypocrites, plural. He swayed some people. He got some people. See, technically speaking, under rabbinic law, you weren't supposed to do that. But rabbinic law isn't the word of God. Right. How twisted church traditions have come yeah. to take away the hearts of the people. Yeah, he says, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox and donkey and from the stall and lead it to give it water? He says, you take care of your animals. And yet the Sabbath was made for man. And here is this woman, this daughter of Abraham. Hey, daughter of faith who has been suffering for 18 long years. And you're going to keep her from being healed? Wow. What was going on? Very interesting. Let's go back to Luke 3 again. Jesus had some things said about him by John the Baptist. And we read about it in verse 4. As is written... In the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, that's John the Baptist, prepare the way for the Lord, that's Jesus, and make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked roads shall become straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. See, Luke isolated this particular miracle to make a point. See, this woman was once bound by Satan, bent over double, but Jesus made her straight. See, that was his job, to straighten out people. 
And yet, Luke then says, she is straight. And this religious leader, therefore, opposes Jesus. And he is the one that's crooked, deceived, and far away from God. You know, the question comes, do we have our convictions on straight? Why do you believe what you believe? It better be in the Word of God and not that which is passed on from your grandfather down to your grandmother to all the way down. Why do you believe what you believe? It better not be the faith that you were born with. It needs to be your own faith from the Word of God. Now, what's very interesting to me is what follows. Remember, in time, the kingdom changes the world. So we're seeing the world change right here, but it's this older woman, bless her heart, who's still fragile, even though now she's walking straight. And I suspect people are saying... And Jesus, that's, I mean, that's the kingdom. That's that's what you're all about. He says, let me tell you two parables. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? Well, it's like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Again, he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like a yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked through all the dough. Interesting. He says, this is what the kingdom is like. And he talks about, in the first one, a man who is a gardener, and the second one, a woman who's a baker. Now, when you talk about the world, you can talk about Jew and Gentile, but another way to talk about evangelizing the world is men and women. So we have a worldview that's thrust upon us right here. He says, the kingdom of God is like a man who plants a mustard seed. Now, it takes, look at how he makes it. He makes an emphasis. It grows. It doesn't just go, mustard seed, psh, tree. No, it, it grows slowly in being transformed from that little tiny seed to a tree where the birds of the air perch their branches. Well, where did the birds come from? Other trees, other nations, they're the Gentiles. And the second one is this woman that bakes whatever, and she puts a little yeast into it, and it doesn't just pop, and you got yourself a cake. It has to cook, and it takes some time. Before the yeast works through the whole dough. Are you with me right here, guys? There is, there's the passage that Jesus takes the concept of the gardener from Ezekiel 17. We've got to look at it quick. Jesus is a master at using the scriptures in the Old Testament. And you know something? If you're not into the Old Testament, you're not really going to understand the ministry of Jesus. We've got to have a deep conviction that we're not just a New Testament church, we're a Bible church. That we really believe in all the concepts and the principles in the Old Testament is what Jesus' whole ministry and the church that comes from his ministry is built upon. Are you with me here, church? Look right here in this parable. Ezekiel 17, verse 22. See if you don't recognize it. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I, will, I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. Well, that's Jesus. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. Well, you break a shoot, it dies, and you plant it on a mountain. That's a kingdom. Well, what mountain is it? On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. Aha, uh-huh, in Israel. It'll produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. All the birds from other nations, the Gentiles, 
They will find shelter and shade in his branches. That's what the church is all about, a place for shelter and shade. Are you with me here, church? All the trees of the field will know, all the nations, will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. He says, you've got to understand, for those that are tall, proud, and green, I will humble them. For those that are low and dry, I will give them life. That's the kingdom. See, we need to understand the kingdom is not something that just goes, wham on. The kingdom takes time to grow. And yes, this older, fragile woman made a radical transformation in the sense of her salvation. But it was going to take time for her faith to grow and to become everything that would allow the world to be filled with the teachings of Jesus Christ. I mean, I think about fragile and exceptional people. I think about the young lady that's with us, Rebecca Deckard from Gainesville, Florida. And uh, we introduced uh, Rebecca a little bit earlier. And I asked if I could share this. And uh, she became a disciple and then married a disciple. And they were very fired up. They'd led the teen ministry. And yet with all the garbage that came into our church, the lack of accountability, the lack of discipleship, in time, he became unfaithful to her. What a shock in the kingdom. It got so bad, he refused to repent, even though they had three kids. And she had to divorce him. Now, for a lot of people, being a single mom with three kids, your life shredded, disciples, quote, down on you, man, you must be evil, you can't even keep your husband. And the shame. She says, you know something? Even though I got a great paying job at Hilton, there's more to life than Hilton Hotel. There's more to life than raising three kids. As awesome as that is. She says, I want to dream again. So she'd been listening to the internet and some of the, uh, particularly some of the uh, sermons from Phoenix and here. And she heard about the Hawaii mission team. She called up Liliana here, who was a friend from Gainesville. And she says, you know something? (laughs) This may sound crazy. I know I got three kids. I don't have any money. But I want to do something with my life. I want to be on the Hawaiian mission team. Do you think they'd take me? Liliana goes, absolutely. They'll take anybody, you know. (laughs) So she literally comes on out this weekend. We talked to her, Kathy Cost. She's on the Hawaii mission team right now. And you see, this, this is a fragile young lady. And you say, we're going to evangelize all the Hawaiian islands. Well, it's going to take some time. See, it was cool. Friday night, Kyle Crank at the Campus Teen Diva. I was, I was so proud of him. It was an amazing lesson. On Acts 20, the Paul given the last charge to the Ephesian elders, and he talked about a clear conscience. But he started the whole lesson. He says, you know something? I want you to know that I believe in the evangelization of the world in this generation. I says, you know, this is what this church is all about. He says, that may seem crazy because there are about maybe 50 people here tonight. Campus of Teens. And we're talking about cranking the whole world, 7 billion. He says, that may seem foolish. That may seem laughable, ridiculous. But I believe it. Do you believe it? And almost every kid in there said, amen. See, it's going to take some time. It takes a little time for that tree to grow and be transformed into a powerful thing where the Gentiles of the nations flow into it. It's going to take some time for the yeast to flow on into it. You know, I'm, I'm greatly moved by our dear sister, Melina Zapata, going back to Santiago. You know, uh, Melina's like a, a daughter to me and Alina. Melina became a disciple around 1994, 95. And uh, she just graduated from, from college. And uh, in six months, she was leading a Bible talk. She's on fire for God. And then she got the dream 
to go into the full-time ministry. She says, you know, it, it cost me everything to be a disciple. She says, you know, the cost to be a disciple at first seemed just so overwhelming. I said, well, can, what was the cost, sis? She says, well, it was boyfriends. Boyfriends? <laughs> well, yeah, that was a little bit of the problem right there. <laughs> so, so my, my thing was is that I could just ask for anything and they would give it to me. And I'd have security. And when I became a disciple, I realized that now I had to find my security in God. But I realized that how awesome that was. And then I wanted to devote myself full time. And I did. And I had that dream for five years. And then I just grew weary and lost heart because it didn't happen. I even stepped out of leadership. And then the opportunity came to go to Portland. I got there. Faith started to grow. And of course, she came on the LA mission team. And now, today, we are sending Melina back to Santiago, Chile, her home nation and town, to become a full-time intern paid for by the Santiago International Christian Church. Is that awesome? Amen. You see, it takes, it takes a little time for dreams to come to fruition. It takes a little time for that tree to grow. It takes a little time for that yeast to go through. Don't grow weary and lose heart about your dream. That's the kingdom of God. It may look fragile like this old lady that got, that got straightened out on that Sabbath day. But you know, give it time. And it blossoms in to a movement that'll saturate the whole world. Last point. Time to decide. Verse 22. Then Jesus went to the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Oh, there it is again. Remember our little theme a few weeks ago? Jesus is the way. And you remember how Luke sets us on up in the journey section from chapter 9, 51 through 19? Is that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Not in the sense that it's one journey, but his life and his teachings. And we need to be in the way because Jesus is the way the truth and the life and the disciples so pulled to that that their primary name in the book of Acts is the way they were followers of the way so he's making his way to Jerusalem what's in Jerusalem it's death it's the cross but it's the salvation of mankind Jesus went through the towns of villages, teaching at his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Must have heard one of his earlier sermons. <laughs> Matthew 7, 13, 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate, because wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, that's one of the most troubling things passages that people have to wrestle with to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Notice that Jesus in some ways doesn't answer the question. The question was, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. See, Jesus answered the real guy's question, the, the real question. What was the real question? Am I going to be saved? Am I in the few? Are my friends in the few? He says, listen, you make every effort to enter through the door. Well, let's see what happens. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he'll answer, I don't know you or where you come from. He'll say, hey, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he'll reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, you evildoers. See, the owner of the house is Jesus. In order to come in to the house, you have to come in under his conditions and in a timely fashion. Time is running out. 
It's time for decision, Jesus is saying. And then he says, there'll be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Japheth, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. He says, there's going to be a lot of surprised people in hell. A lot of people are going to be blown away. Man, I'm in hell? How the heck did I get here? I mean, I, I, I knew about Jesus, and golly, I went to some of the church services, and I thought Jesus was a great guy. I tried to love my neighbor, sort of. Jesus says, people will come from the east, the west, the north, and the south. And they'll take their place in the feast of the kingdom of God all over the world. There it is. World evangelism just comes off in every single passage. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. This is a reference to the Jew and the Gentile. The Jews are referenced at the beginning. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets of the kingdom of God. He says, you're not going to be with them. You're going to be sad. You're going to be distraught. He says, but they're going to be a bunch of Gentiles from north, south, east, and west. They're going to be at the feast in the kingdom. Indeed, I love the way the phrasing is. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first. There are those Gentiles who are last who will be first to come on in. Not every Gentile, but there are those. And inferred is, there are those who are first, Jews, who will be last. Not all, but some. You know, I've got to ask you, What's your heart towards Jesus' teaching of a narrow door? I find it vacillates from freaked out to fired up. People are freaked out because they're not in it. Family members aren't in it. Some dead family members aren't in it. Other people are fired up because it's only by grace that we even get a chance to know the truth and then get a chance to share with our families. Amen. Well, how narrow is it? Well, let's just see what the scriptures say. How about the atheists? Well, Psalms 14 says it's the fool that doesn't believe in God. Whoops, got a little narrower. Well, how about the polytheists, the people that believe in a whole bunch of gods, like the Hindus? In Exodus 20, verse 3, Ten Commandments, God says, have no other god before you. Whoops, one god. Well, if I believe in one god, will I be saved? Jesus says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, my gosh. That takes out the Jews and the Muslims. Well, there are a lot of people who believe in Jesus, particularly in America. But Paul says all scriptures is inspired by God. you got to believe the word of God is the word of God and then obey it. Jesus says in that, you got to be born again. There are a lot of people that got baptized as little babies. But they never made an adult decision. They're not saved. Jesus says that in order to be saved, you have to have faith. In the Acts 2.38, you got to repent and be baptized to have your sins forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit. What? You mean praying Jesus in your heart is a false doctrine? Absolutely. You mean they're not saved? Ooh, baby, it's getting narrow. It says that when you're baptized, you got to be a disciple. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them. you got to be a disciple when you're baptized. And then he says, I wish that you were either hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Oh, my goodness! You mean not all the disciples are saved? Absolutely not. You mean going to the right 
church doesn't say me. No. Jesus says, you got to be hot or cold. I want you to look warm. I'll spit you out of my mouth. Why? Because cold, everybody knows where they stand. These are baptized people. Those are followers. Hot, they know where they stand. They're, they're baptizing people. They're on fire for God. But the lukewarm, they don't know where they stand. They think they're rich, they've acquired wealth, they don't need a thing. But in fact, they're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus says, those whom I love, I rebuke. So repent. He says, I'm standing at the door of your heart, knocking. Now let's get the vision for what he's saying right here. A lukewarm church. A lot of people think lukewarm. Well, you have a few lukewarm people. No, no, no. You're in a lukewarm church. You're in a flatly dangerous situation. The vision of Revelation 3 is this. Jesus is knocking at the door of the church. Jesus is outside of the church. He's not in the church. That's why so many people are leaving and even going to denominational churches because they say the spirit isn't here. Some people say, well, I'm going to stay because it's, it's got the truth. Let me tell you something. You can't choose between the truth and the spirit. You've got to worship God in both truth and spirit. Are you with me right here? See, we've we got we to get a conviction here, guys, how wicked and how evil a lukewarm church is. That's a pretty narrow road. Are you in it? Or are you freaking out? You know, if you're freaking out, time to get into Bible study. Time to get baptized. You know, we've got a lot of people in here that have been coming to our church for a week and still haven't gotten baptized yet. It's time to make a decision. We got a lot of people that have been disciples for years, that have been tending for weeks, but still aren't sold out disciples. It's time to get restored and make a decision. It's a narrow road. Time is running out. Do what you need to do and do it quickly. You know, uh, a dear sister to us all is uh, Joan Bartholomew. And her maiden name was uh, Utahan, which is Filipino. And uh, she lived over in Mindanao, which is the southernmost island there in the Philippines. Very Muslim area. She lived in Davao City. And at 16, she came to America. She, she knew three languages. But English was not her best language. And so one thing she had to do was to really work on her English when she came. Her fam whole family came. And uh, sad to say, uh, when she came to America, she started getting into the world. But she did go to church a lot and, and you know, had a love for God. Well, one day at the college campus there at the University of Hawaii Hilo, Kyle met Joan's sister and invited her sister to church. When she came to church, she was flat, fired up, told Joan about it. Joan, they're so fired up. They read their Bible every day. They meet every day. They are incredible. Joan goes, it's a cult. I must go and rescue my sister. Oh, my God. So Joan goes. She's blown away. She sees something like she's never seen before. A group of people that weren't the same color, weren't the same age, but they all loved each other a whole bunch. They even liked each other, too. In two months... Joan was baptized into Christ. You know, her first view of this narrow road was, it's got to be a cult. Wow. And yet now, this lady is going to Honolulu, Hawaii, with her sold-out disciple husband. And they're going to be putting together the 10-member Hawaii mission team with the 16-member remnant group. And the Hawaiian islands are never going to be the same. Are you with me right here, guys? Well, let's finish it on out. 
Time for a decision. Verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Well, that sounds pretty nice to the Pharisees. I mean, Herod's changed his position a little bit. Remember Luke 9? I mean, you remember all the lessons, right? In Luke 9, Herod was so fired up, he wanted to see Jesus because he was hearing about all these miracles. Now he's changed his position just slightly. Wants to kill him. So Jesus tells the, the Pharisees, and here's where we get our hint. He replied, go tell that fox. Jesus is name calling. Oh yeah. Go to the bank on that one. Now, Jesus understood that Herod and the Pharisees were in cahoots. See, it looked like that they were helping Jesus out. Though Luke is silent on the issue, it wasn't for their, to help Jesus. And besides that, he was taking Jesus away from his plan. Let's look. Go tell that fox. I will drive out demons and heal people today, and tomorrow and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Well, right here, we have, of course, the foreshadowing of the death and the burial for three days and then the resurrection, right? Amen, guys? And Jesus says, you go tell that fox. Now, the fox is most likely a reference back to Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 15. That says, beware of the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. See, foxes, they're deceivers. They're cunning. Foxes also are destructive. He says, you go tell that cunning, destructive fox, Herod, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. I will drive out demons and heal people today, tomorrow, and on the third day I reach my goal. I will be undeterred by a man. For my destiny and God's timing determines when I will die. And it's not yet my time. He says, come to think of it, no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. I mean, after all, that's where they kill him. And that's where I'm going. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hand gathers her chicks under her wings, but you weren't willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right here, Jesus laments with what's called a double vocative. We've seen it before in Luke. Oh, Martha, Martha. But the more well-known one is in 2 Samuel, where David laments the death of his son. Oh, Absalom! Absalom, my son! This was a heart-wrenching cry. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who killed the prophets? Stone those who sent you. Oh my God, the axe is at the root. How often I've longed to gather your children together. The picture of Jesus, the picture of God, is a nurturing, caring being that wants to pull together his people and take care of them. He says, but you weren't. Look, your house has left you desolate. The end had come. He says, you won't see him again until you say, blessed is he who comes named Lord. That was said in Luke 19 at the entry 
into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. No, that year of grace was gone. There was no change. The axe was at the root. And it was so bad that the spiritual condition of the house of Israel was one of desolation. You know, uh, yesterday was my uh, 54th birthday. It's kind of a weird birthday because I was born in 1954, and I am 54. That's a long time. That's a long time. And, you know, a lot of people were very kind and said happy birthday. And the second question was, well, bro, what, what, what fun thing did you, did you do for your birthday? Well, I got up early. Had a quiet time. That's a cranking quiet time. See, the older you get, the more cranking your quiet times are because, you know, you're, you're getting closer. <laughs> You know, you don't want to have a bad week and then, hey, today your soul is... Oh, no, Lord! (laughs) Then we have a little presentation I I can't go into detail about, but these presentations for the mission team and for Melina took me about two hours to put together. And and Elena, I love Elena, when she has her quiet times, many often she puts on some spiritual music to listen to. And that's pretty cool, because it does soften your heart. And I, I love music, she loves music, and... And so I thought as I was kind of getting frustrated with these gifts that I was trying to give, I said, you know something, it's my birthday. So I went over to the computer, and I, I have these YouTube songs saved, you know. So I said, okay, what's my birthday? So I started out with you two, it's a beautiful day. <laughs> then I cranked on the Scorpion's Wind of Change, <laughs> moved on into Garth Brooks and the dance, <laughs> Alan Jackson, Remember When, then I had to go Peter, Paul, and Mary, where, where have all the flowers gone? <laughs> then I played the Portland song with DJ and Casey twice. I said, you know, there's, there's nothing like song to move your heart. And after I got all these, I, 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 was, I was not just fired up, I was crying. You know, that's a, that's a funny thing. You get older, you start crying. It's ridiculous. Lena comes on out. What's wrong? What's wrong? No, nothing, babe. Nothing. I'm just... Just growing old. No more problems. <laughs> so then after I got all these gifts done, I spent the next four hours studying for the lesson today. And I was going to take a break at two. Oh, yeah, I had lunch. Lena fixed me a little tuna fish without bread. And uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't have any bread. So, at 2 o'clock, I was going to take a break and go outside because it's a real pretty day. And then, then the Lord put something on my heart. And I got, I got, like, really fired up. I said, you know something? We're going to announce a trash-a-thon tomorrow. And I don't know why. I think I just need to crank the trash-a-thon right now. I need to start calling up people and getting people to support me to pick up trash so we can get our special missions contribution cranking. So I started calling. I called about 12 people. Got a hold of five. Four of them gave donations. One gave a donation of 2,000. One, 2,500. Another, 1,000. I just got another 101 before I came on into church this morning. I mean, the Lord blessed me in one hour with over $5,000 for a trash-a-thon. I was getting fired up. Well, then what did you do then? Well, then I had to study for my lesson last night. We had the bigger givers from the church come together at the Gonzalez's house. And, uh, well, (laughs) DJ was invited, but it wasn't for that reason. (laughs) And so I came up with this lesson, you know, about, you know, really challenging. And the Lord had really put on my heart. I mean, I think, as you all know, we have our missions contribution in June. And uh, our goal is 120,000, which is 15 times what we're giving. We're giving approximately 8,500 a week right now, sometimes a little more. But, you know, I've, I've been feeling terrible that Raul and Linda, who have been working on the mission field, are going to have to come back here and get a secular job. And so the Lord just put upon my heart. I said, you know something, this is, this is ridiculous. I said, I just cranked 5,000 in a trash-a-thon. 
I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring before the rich bros and sisters. Maybe a better term is more well-to-do. <laughs> About, we could put these people on if we give a 20 time sir. So I talked to Elena in the car. I said, okay, babe. This is what we're about. She said, amen. So I told the brothers and sisters, I said, right, here's the thing, guys. Since January, we've not received our retirement. We were supposed to get 1500 a month for our retirement. So we pushed that aside. That saved the church 9000 I said, we're going to give 20 times plus what we give weekly. And I told that to the brothers and sisters. I said, the reason is 20 times, if everybody would do that, would give us 170000 and we could put Raul and Linda on full-time working there in Orange County. And, you know, it's, it's pretty awesome. You know, it's kind of sad, though. I had Nick kind of quarterback everything, and I guess one person told him, I said, well, you know, I think we'll come. You know, we've done this all before. And I go, well, that's funny, because I haven't. Oh, you mean missions contributions. Oh, I've done a couple of those in my time. But I've never been in a one-and-a-half-year-old movement where the first year of the church planting in L.A. with 42 disciples, there was 101 baptisms, 60 restorations. I've never seen a baby church send out a mission team to Hawaii and then two months later send out another mission team to New York and then send one of our prized single sisters down as a full-time intern to Santiago. That's just the beginning of the second year. That's just the first three months. I don't know what we're going to do the last nine. And if you think you've been down this way before, you haven't. And one of the things that, that I, just, I, I just challenge everybody to do, I said, you know something, the, the, th the thing that I've loved about the study of Luke is that one passage. At first I was disappointed because Matthew says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. But Luke, because it's a different time, just said that Jesus said, seek the kingdom. I said, you know something? That's what my life's all about. Seek the kingdom. One person even inferred, ah, Kip wants more money. Well, not for myself. But they were right. I want more money. I want to put Raul on to save more souls. Guilty. We had an incredible meal. The spirit of the brothers and sisters was incredible. To a person, everybody was fired up. I went home. Time to work on the sermon again. Worked on it till a little bit before 12. Lena had gone to bed already. And then at just about 12 o'clock, I turned off the light. Went on in. Woke Elena up. And we had our prayer. Like we do every night. That was my birthday. See that? That's the kingdom. Now, you know, as I reflected on those songs, the dance, talks about Garth Brooks, who says, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened in this dance of life. A lot of pain. But you know, I would have missed it all. And there's sadness at times in my heart. There's hurt for what's happened in our former fellowship. There's hurt for all those that have fallen away and left the Lord in places that no longer have disciple churches. There's hurt for some things in our family. But you know something? In the midst of all of that, I have God. And he is my very great reward. Oh, I can say, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, all this sadness. I can say, oh, Absalom, Absalom. But you know, for me, it's all about the kingdom. And I'm kind of excited. Because I've never been this way before. It gets more and more exciting as you get closer to heaven. 54 is not so bad. And yet, 
at the time that Jesus spoke this, he said, the house is desolate. I hope that today, you that are faithful, sold out disciples, appreciate what you get. And that you are all about seeking the kingdom. When the trash a thons announced, you're going, oh, baby. I've never done a trash a thon before. And I'm going to crank. When the special comes, I hope you'll join me and Elena and all those that gathered in that room to give 20 times Amen. and let God have the victory. I pray that you'll not let your heart get wounded. For if your heart is wounded in the talk about money, then perhaps it's a little too important for you. And perhaps you need to remember that the only thing that counts is to repent or perish. For at the end of the day, if you are faithful and you stay on your way to Jerusalem, to death, to the cross, and to salvation, then we will be with God forever and ever. Thank you, and God bless.